So today we're supposed to be talking about data communications and the simple view starts with this thing called a message, data that gets shared between sender and receiver. That could be an email, a web page, an MP3 download, any, any kind of message, any kind of data. A communications channel is a device and usually it's made out of wires that can reliably transport messages, get them from one place to another. Protocols are the rules that establish both the meaning of the message and the way the channel is used to transfer the message so that messages get understood between sender and receiver. A node is any device attached to the network and we're going to find out that messages often pass among several nodes between sender and receiver. And finally, a host is a computer attached to a network. All hosts are nodes, but not all nodes are hosts. We're going to have things like routers and switches and gateways that are also nodes, but that are not necessarily the general purpose computer. So that is the simple view. As I said, there's a physical connection. The channel is the communications facility that carries messages. We often represent it with a lightning bolt or a pipe or sometimes even a cloud. And a communications channel can look like that thing that's on the diagram. I've got a host computer at one end with a network interface controller in it. A link that could be radio or fiber optic or wire or maybe even infrared, a router, that's a node, but it's not a host, and it's got two network interface controllers in it, one for sending and one for receiving, and then at the other end, we have another host with yet another network interface controller in it. The link is that physical connection between nodes. We're using the word channel in two different ways here, and I hate that. One link might carry several channels. And I'll give you an example, cable television. Is there any cable television anymore? Not very much, but satellite television. I happen to have a satellite radio in my car because I bought my car used. I wouldn't have paid for that satellite radio if I'd been buying a new car. It's got 140 channels or something on it, right? of different, different kinds of radio I can listen to. But there's only that one signal coming from the satellite to me. So we're using channel in kind of two different ways here. Anyway, the link is the physical connection and it might carry several channels like the several channels of satellite radio that come to my car. One internet connection can deliver more than one stream you can open a couple of tabs in your browser and while one of them is still filling in, go to the next one and ask it to go to a different website. Messages, communications between cooperating applications. So a web server and a web client, a, web, a mail server and an email client and so on. Messages can take many forms. I've already given you several examples. They're all represented digitally. They are streams of bits. Actually, they're streams of bytes. Communication, when we talk about data communication, we are talking almost exclusively about serial communication, right? No parallel communication or very little in data communications. Message length is a concern because if I am downloading the movie Gone with the Wind, it's tying up the communication channel for a long time, right? And we're going to fix that by doing something we call packet switching. Bandwidth, we're do, uh, doing a whole bunch of terminology here. Bandwidth is the amount of information a link can carry, and it's measured either in hertz, that's cycles per second, or bits per second. Speed 
is the number of bits per second, right? Okay, so I, I did bandwidth wrong. Bandwidth is measured in hertz, period, the end. Speed is measured in bits per second. And they are not the same thing. Latency, and we talked about latency when we talked about rotational latency in disks. The time from we're ready to do something until the time the something is ready for us. It's the same concept in data communications. Remember, a nanosecond is this long. And for people who are not in class, I'm holding my fingers uh, just under a foot apart. And that means that there is a delay when we send information through some kind of communication medium. That latency is often measured in milliseconds. So thousandths of a second, pretty long time as far as computers are concerned. Circuit switching creates a dedicated channel between source and destination, and that channel is present for the duration of the connection. The picture on the slide is a telephone switchboard. I don't think those exist anymore, but if you see the young women who are working the switchboard, have a bunch of, of wires there that they can plug into jacks that on the switchboard. And in fact, you grab two, two jacks, one from each end, uh, two plugs, um, and plug them into two jacks. You've created an electrical connection between those two jacks. And that is how telephone switching worked before the invention of dial telephones. And for quite a while after that, it worked that way for long distance calls and for calls within companies. So that's circuit switching. We make a, a physical connection between source and destination. Packet switching, which is also called datagram switching. Each packet is routed from one node to the next independently. And my, my example of packet switching is if I take a couple of letters and address them to, oh, somebody I know in Los Angeles and drop them in the mail, they're probably not going to follow the same route. At some point, they're going to get separated. They'll come back together at the other end at my friend's house in Los Angeles, but they don't necessarily follow the same route. They don't even necessarily arrive at the same time or in order. That is packet switching, also called datagram switching. Messages get segmented into packets. So I have that download of a long movie, and it's going to get segmented into packets that are perhaps 1,500 bytes each. So there might be a lot of packets if it's a long movie. Now, I, I can send the packets and not tie up the channel continuously with that long movie. A packet is data encapsulated by a packet header. The packet header has information about the packet, including its source, where did it come from, and its destination, where does it have to be delivered. And if you recall that picture of the postal envelope on the previous slide, there was a destination address written in the middle, and up in the upper left-hand corner, there was the source address. Exactly the same idea. We use packets because of efficiency. That solves the problem of message length. I can now interleave packets of different messages. And once again, it's equivalent to an envelope that contains pages. Questions about that? Okay, advantages. Channel utilization efficiency. Um, we get a reasonable unit for data routing. Um, one of the things we have to worry about in data communications is error control. If I send, oh, let's see, I'm trying to download a copy of the Raspberry Pi operating system, which is about three gigabytes. If I downloaded it all in one giant message, and there was a one-bit error in it somewhere, I have, to, I have to discard the whole three gigabytes and try again. If it's busted up into 1,500 byte packets, and one of those has an error, we just resend that packet. 
How cool is that? An alternative to dedicating the channel for the entire length. Uh, packets from several sources can share the channel. That's why you can surf the web, listen to music, and receive email all on one device. Each sender and receiver appears to have the channel all to itself. Now, there are some timing considerations in there, as you may have noticed if you've tried to do a, a large download and then listen to music, but the application can't tell that there's other stuff going on. The receiving computer processes data in blocks, uh, the, the amount of data in one packet, instead of trying to deal with it a character at a time or a byte at a time. Okay, routers are nodes on a network. They are specialized devices that pass packets from one network to another. And usually the router will have more than two network interface controllers, and it will decide, it'll receive a packet on one and decide which one to send it out on. That's how it selects the route for a message. So a packet arrives at an input port, the, the processor in the router decides where the packet should go, and it is sent on the correct output port. A gateway performs the same functions as a router, but it is used to connect dissimilar networks. So a router might connect several Ethernet networks. A gateway might connect an Ethernet to, oh, your Starlink satellite connection. And that means that the gateway is able to convert packet headers for dissimilar networks. Now we need to talk about reliable and unreliable protocols. And the first thing I want to caution you is that the words reliable and unreliable are used differently when we're talking about data communications um, than in every day. Um, I'm pretty reliable. I'm likely to be here at 11 o'clock Tuesdays and Thursdays for the whole semester unless I get the COVID again. If I do, I'm not going to come and give it to you, okay? I'm going to stay away. But that's not the kind of reliable that we're talking about here. A reliable protocol provides for an acknowledgement of messages similar to certified mail with, with that little green card that is the return receipt. So if I take an ordinary letter and drop it in the mail, it is almost certain to be delivered. It might take a while. The post office is, is kind of struggling right now, but it is almost certain to be delivered. I have no way of knowing whether it was delivered or not. If I pay extra for certified mail and put that little green card on there, the person who receives the letter signs the little green card and the postal service brings it back to me. Now, if all is well, I know that my letter was delivered. If I don't get the green card back, I know that something is wrong. I don't know what's wrong, but I know that something is wrong. Either the letter got lost or the green card got lost on its way back to me. Unreliable, that is the ordinary drop it in the mail. There is no acknowledgement. Messages almost always get through but there's no way of knowing whether they got through or not. So reliable messages have an acknowledgement, something that says, yes, I got it, and unreliable um, reliable protocols. And unreliable protocols do not provide for an acknowledgement. So some more terminology. A local area network is one where the network operator owns the equipment and the wires. So we have a local area network. It's a big one. Um, on this campus, KSU owns the equipment and the wires. Local area networks can span a department um, or my house or buildings or a campus, and they tend to operate at pretty high speeds. Wide area networks used to be, and sometimes still are, leased data lines. So the 
the endpoint equipment and the connection belong to the phone company or, or some other carrier like the phone company. And they connected local networks. So this campus is connected to the campus on Kennesaw using fiber optic cable that belongs to PeachNet, the University System of Georgia's uh, network service. We could equally well have gotten that same fiber connection or a similar one from AT&T. But PeachNet is us, so that's good. Now, we mostly use the internet instead of getting connections from the phone company. So if I have a headquarters in downtown Atlanta and a branch office in Marietta, I'm probably going to get internet service at both of them and pass my messages between them using the internet instead of getting a, a direct connection from the phone company. So the terminology has changed. You'll still hear people talking about wide area networks, but modern terminology would be local area networks, service providers like PeachNet or AT&T, and endpoints where the connections are. A protocol stack, we, we define protocol as the rules for communicating. I'm not sure I said it quite that simply the first time. Uh, protocols are the rules for communicating between two network nodes in this case. A protocol stack is an abstraction of the hardware and software. There's, there's a hardware and software involved in those protocols, and the protocol stack, stack abstracts those. We'll see some pictures in a minute. Modularization is an extremely good programming and design practice. That's what makes it possible to send, oh, say, email over an Ethernet cable or a wireless connection in your home. Different, different physical connections, different network interfaces, different programming, but the same protocol. One part of that stack can be replaced without replacing everything else. So I can replace wire with cellular radio and now I can get data on my cell phone instead of needing an Ethernet cable. There are two major stacks, the OSI model and the Internet Protocol Suite model. We're going to look first at the OSI model. OSI is Open System Interconnect. You don't need to remember that from me. You can look it up if you need to. The Open Systems Interconnect model is a reference model. That means that we don't really design or we don't really build protocol stacks that way. The Internet Protocol Suite stack, we really do build that way, but this is a reference model. It's intended to show the various pieces of a communication protocol. And so basically the people who designed the OSI model separated the layers as cleanly as possible. There is a physical layer down at the bottom, that's the wires, okay, or the radio channel or something like that. It is um, not shown in the Internet Protocol Suite model, okay? Now, down at the bottom, we have the physical layer, and that involves moving bits from one place to another. In the data link layer, we're going to encapsulate those bits, usually with Ethernet headers, but sometimes with something else, and call them frames. Moving up, the network layer is responsible for routing and for logical addressing, and we're going to call the, the data that gets moved at that layer a packet. The transport layer, that's end-to-end -end connections, and when we want a reliable connection, that is one with acknowledgments, that happens at the transport layer. We're still moving chunks of data around. We're just going to call them segments rather than packets or frames. The session layer, that is communication between hosts and we're moving data, messages. Presentation layer involves any encoding, compression, encryption, anything that we do to massage the signal. And once again, it's data. 
And at the application layer, we're doing web browsing or music listening or email or something like that. Now, for me, you do not need to memorize the OSI model. That's something that you look up if you need it, okay? This recording is being used for another professor's class. And let me say to that other professor's class, you better know whether your professor wants you to memorize this. Don't memorize it is for Brown students, okay? Now, if you do have to memorize it, starting at the bottom, remember people do not throw sausage pizza away. Physical Data Network Transport Session Presentation Application. So if you do have to memorize it, um, people do not throw sausage pizza away. I had a German exchange student in the class last spring, and there is a German phrase, I don't speak German, and last spring was a year ago, but they have a German phrase that is the same sort of mnemonic, and uh, he was um, happy to share that with the class. Okay, down at the physical layer, that's where we're sending a stream of bits from one place to another. So primarily, it is hardware, that network interface controller, the network card. The physical protocol includes the medium, and that is how are we transmitting these bits? Is it cellular radio or Wi-Fi or um, Ethernet cable or something else? The signaling method, how are we changing bits into variations of that physical method. And that includes synchronization and timing and the physical connections. You may not have wondered why you can buy a Belkin Ethernet cable and plug it into the Ethernet jack on an Apple computer. The answer is standardization. The connectors are standardized along with everything else. Remember, we talked about the importance of standardization on the very first day of this class. The data link layer is responsible for reliable transmission between two adjacent nodes. These are nodes that are connected together. They might be 20 miles apart and connected by microwave, or they might be 10 feet apart and be connected by Ethernet cable but we have reliable transmission, and by reliable, remember, we mean that messages get acknowledged. Packets, we call packets frames. They're, it's all packets, but we have different names for them. Sometimes we think about the logical link layer, which is software, and the medium access control sublayer, which is hardware, but often you can just think about the whole thing as the data link layer. The network layer provides logical addressing. So this is where the IP address comes in. And it provides for routing. How your packet, where you're, you're going to browse to Google and look something up, how does that packet that is your Google query get to the Google Data Center in Lithia Springs? That's routing. It is connectionless in the idea that we are routing packets, not messages. So remember the example of dropping two envelopes in the mail, and although they are addressed to the same place, they might not follow the same path or even arrive in the same order. That's connectionless. The transport layer divides larger messages into smaller messages, um, or large messages into messages suitable for packetization. So instead of gigabits, gigabytes, of Raspberry Pi operating system, I get hundreds of bytes of an Ethernet packet. On the receiving end, it reassembles those packets into messages. It provides for error control with error checking, provides for flow control. Flow control is when one node is sending faster than the other node can process and receive. So I'm here to tell you Google can send data way faster than my PC can process and receive it. Flow control allows a station to say, hold up a little bit there. Let me get caught up. 
and it's done with a flow control message. The session layer, if, if we have the concept of a connection as we do with voice over IP, the session layer is responsible for doing that. It's also responsible for closing the connection at the end of the session. Presentation layer um, does code translation. So if I have an old version of Windows Server that has data encoded in UCS2, and I'm trying to communicate with somebody that speaks UTF-8, that translation happens in the presentation layer. Encryption and decryption happen in the presentation layer if necessary. Compressing and uncompressing happen in the presentation layer. The application layer is the interface between the network stack and the application. So the email server talks to the application layer and it's up to the application layer to talk to the presentation layer and so on down the stack. And that's how all of this stuff gets modularized. The application talks to the application layer using an application program interface, an API. It's very well defined, it's part of the protocol. The application does not need to know about any of the rest of that. The application doesn't care whether down at the physical layer we're talking about cellular radio or high-speed fiber optic cable. Not only does it not need to care, it doesn't even know about that stuff. The principal protocols are the ones that we're mostly going to be interested in in this class, and they're not the only ones, are the Ethernet protocol, which is the primary protocol for local area networks, and the Internet protocol, or IP, which is the primary protocol for routed networks. Um, Ethernet and IP work together. So Ethernet is the local area protocol, and IP is the wide area protocol. If you power up your computer and browse to a website, not now, you're speaking Ethernet through the local network to a router somewhere operated by KSU, and that router then speaks internet protocol to the various nodes to get you to whatever site you're browsing. TCP IP has several upper layer protocols, and we'll talk about those. I think, I think we talk about those a week from Tuesday because of spring break next week. Um, and there are plenty of other protocols. I'll mention a few of them as we go along, but the ones that, that you mostly need to care about and be interested in are Ethernet and IP. Okay, so we're now going to switch over. That was the introductory part, and I guess I should pause for questions. Nobody ever has any questions in this class. And that, that either means I'm doing a perfect job of educating or I'm doing a perfect job of baffling. Okay, this is a, a simple LAN, and the, we don't build them like that anymore, but we used to. A sends a message to C. B and D potentially hear the message, but it's addressed to C, so they don't do anything with it. C hears the message and processes it, does something with it. So in this case, the network is a bus in the sense that we talked about a multi-point bus when we were talking about computer buses. And early Ethernet, we don't make Ethernets this way anymore, but we could if we were masochists, worked just like that, an Ethernet cable with some number of trans transceivers, which is a portmanteau word of transmitter and receiver, okay? Took the trans from transmitter and the receiver from receiver and jammed them together. That is the prevalent lo local area networking technology, but we don't, don't build them this way anymore. Speeds of 10 megabits, 100, 1,000, and gigabit Ethernet is now not uncommon. Multiple access, that means that we can have two or more devices listening to the same messages or even on the same wire. And carrier sense 
with collision detection. Carrier sense means that one of those transceivers can listen to what's going on on the wire and determine whether it's busy or not. And collision detection means that transceivers can tell whether their message got tromped on by some other transmitting device. We'll see a diagram of that coming up. The Ethernet frame looks like this, and I have to get over here where I can see that thing because I can't see it on the slide. There's a preamble, and that preamble is a string of bits that can be recognized by the Ethernet transceiver. A, a start of message device, I mean byte, then two addresses, destination address and source address. Those are both the things that we call MAC addresses, media access control addresses, and they're 48 bits or six bytes long. An ether type that tells us something about what we're doing, and then a payload, which can be 46 to 1500 bytes. There are now jumbo frame ethernets that can move 9,000 bytes in one frame, 8,960 of them of data. That reduces the overhead from packetizing. We can have a 32-bit VLAN address following the source address, and that allows us to separate traffic logically into multiple virtual local area networks. FCS is the cyclic redundancy check it's used for error control. There are 96 bit times, that is 12 byte times, the amount of time it would take for 12 bytes to be transmitted on the ethernet of inter-packet gap after each packet. So there's a, a silent period after each packet. Okay. Medium access control or media access control or MAC is a 48-bit address, six bytes, and source and destination each have a MAC address, and they are globally unique. There are not supposed to be two Ethernet adapters with the same MAC addresses anywhere. We write them as six hexadecimal pairs, six bytes. So remember, two hex digits equal one byte and we'll write those six hex pairs separated by colons. A network interface device, a network uh, interface controller, will only process frames with its own address. It might see frames with other destination addresses, but it will not process them unless there is usually a way to place a network interface into this thing that's called promiscuous mode. And that means it'll process anything that gets sent to it. That is how network monitors and things like that work. So if you've ever done anything with Wireshark, which is a network monitoring program, uh, it puts the, the Ethernet interface into promiscuous mode so that it can see everything that comes by. An address of all ones, 48 bits of ones, is a broadcast address, and every network inter interface controller will process frames addressed to the broadcast address. Okay, the first three bytes out of six address the manufacturer, identify the manufacturer, but there are two zero bits in there, so there are 22 bits for manufacturer. 2 to the 20th is a million, right? So 2 to the 21st is 2 million, 2 to the 22nd is 4 million different manufacturer addresses. Although some manufacturers have more than one manufacturer address. Then there's 24 bits for the device, so 16 million devices addressable for each manufacturer. Large manufacturers People like IBM or Dell or folks like that have more than one manufacturer prefix. So medium access control Mac does a four-step procedure with Ethernet. This is the Ethernet Mac. Listen to see whether the transmission medium is idle. And if it is, go ahead and send your message. If the medium is busy, 
That is, if there's already a message on the wire, listen until it's idle, and then send your message. If a collision is detected, and I'll show you how a collision could occur in just a minute. If a collision is detected, stop transmitting, wait a random amount of time, and try again. And we'll see in a diagram the importance of that random amount of time. So, in the diagram that I showed you at the very beginning of a simple Ethernet, if A is sending and B wants to send, B listens until A stops sending. And then B starts sending and everybody is happy. However, if both B and C want to send, A is sending, both B and C want to send, they both listen until A stops, and then they both transmit, because that's what the protocol says. Right, that's a collision, and both messages are lost. Both B and C can detect that collision. And having detected a collision, they both wait a random amount of time. This is a short random amount of time. We're talking about milliseconds, right? One of them's going to win almost all the time. One of them will, will pick a shorter random time than the other one almost all the time. If they happen to pick the same time, there's going to be another collision and we'll do it all over again. One of them wins and is able to send. The other one listens and waits and is later able to send. So we sort out that collision. As the number of stations in an Ethernet increases, the number of collisions necessarily increases. As the traffic increases, the number of collisions increases. Collisions harm network throughput because we had to stop and then wait and then start over. It's possible for the number of collisions to be so large that the network is what is called saturated. We're spending all of our time recovering from collisions and almost no time getting data through. This is very bad news. Uh, the solution is to break the network up into smaller collision domains. And we're going to do that with the thing that is an Ethernet switch. Ethernets were used to be built using hubs. A hub was a device that simply connected all the wires together. Every, at least logically, every device could hear every other device. And so devices connected with a hub were one large collision domain. A switch connects two ports when I need traffic between those two ports. And only those two devices can hear the traffic. The result of that is that I can have many smaller collision domains. There's a picture of that coming up. Here's a hub. Everybody is connected together. And there's one giant collision domain. In switching over on the right side of the diagram, ports get connected dynamically as needed. And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. Here is a switched Ethernet. Um, there's more than one device on each port. I've got ports 0, 1, and 2 on the switch. Devices A and B are on port 0. C, D, E, and E are, C, D, and e are on port 2. And F, G, H, J, and K are on port 1. So I have three different collision domains. Instead of how many devices do I have there? 5, 10. Instead of having one 10 device collision domain, I've got a two, a three, and a five device collision domain. So three smaller collision domains. Now, how does the switch know what's where? It learns MAC addresses. The switch, as it is operating, builds a table that learns which address addresses are on what ports. In switched Ethernet, the switch port is a device in each collision domain. The switch listens to figure out which devices are on what ports, identifies which packets need to go to other segments. Packets for an unknown destination get sent to all ports except the one that the packet came in on. 
if the, if the unknown destination is in the same collision domain as the sender, it doesn't need to be switched. It's already been received. So a switch doesn't send a packet to the, to the port that it came in on. When there's a reply, the switch will learn which port has that address device, and from then on it will send only to that port. In a modern switched Ethernet, there's only one device per port. All devices talk only to the switch, and no collisions are possible. In a modern switched Ethernet, we completely get rid of collisions. Now you could get an Ethernet hub, plug it in there into the switch and run three or four devices. Nobody really does that unless they're trying to do some monitoring or something like that. Now, when we get to building big Ethernets, like the one the size of the KSU campus, if two switch ports are connected together, possibly through another switch or more than one other switch, right? We go switch, 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 and bang, we're back at the original switch. A packet with no address in the switch will be broadcast to all the ports except the one that it came in on, but then that connected report, uh, port will receive the broadcast, and it'll come back to the original port, the one that it didn't get sent to the first time. And it'll send it out again and again and again and again. This is a broadcast storm. And that renders the network useless until something happens to stop the broadcast storm. Um, sometimes switches are smart enough to detect that that's going on and, and essentially throw that packet away. Otherwise, you have to reset things. There are two ways to prevent broadcast storms other than having a very simple network to begin with, the spanning tree protocol and the shortest path bridging protocol. And I, I encourage you to read the spanning tree poem by uh, Blast. What's Radia's last name? Radia Perlman. It's in your textbook. You should have noticed it when you were reading the chapter. The spanning tree protocol allows switches to cooperate to determine a, a route that will reach every port on every switch. In disable, you can see the, the blocked by spanning tree pro protocol on the slide, it'll disable redundant routes. So we can still reach everybody, but we can no longer have broadcast storms. Now, maybe we put that redundant route in there because we know that there's a lot of traffic between those two switches and we wanted to give it two paths. That's very bad because then you're going to have broadcast storms and spanning tree prevents that. Shortest path bridging does allow redundant links, but it prevents, either prevents or, or detects and stops loops we find um, shortest path bridging only in carrier class equipment. So AT&T will have shortest path bridging route, uh, routers or switches, but you can't buy one at Micro Center. Wireless Ethernet uses radio, so we can't do switching. We're back to the collision domain. Um, we have to use that original carrier sense multiple access with collision detection protocol. That is why you do not want to overload your wireless network. The radio link can be reserved. The protocol says a station can send a request to send message to an access point, and the access point will reply with a clear to send message. And at that point, the link is reserved briefly. The wireless standards come from the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE, and they're the 802.11 standards with a letter suffix, so 802.11 ABC and so on. There are some separate standards, and these are interoperability standards and uh, testing standards from the Wi-Fi Alliance. They are supposedly more consumer friendly, and they have renamed some of the IEEE standards, so you have things like Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 6. Those are just different names for the 
corresponding IEEE standard. Wireless networks operate in the 2.4 gigahertz range. That's the same as your microwave oven, the 5 gigahertz band, and there is an allocation in the 6 gigahertz band. Now, I don't think you can buy access points for yet, but they're coming. Now, people will tell you that the, your microwave oven can interfere with your Wi-Fi because they're on the same 2.4 gigahertz band. Listen up. If that's happening, your microwave oven is leaking radiation and you, you want to get it repaired or discarded, okay? The, those microwaves should not escape from that microwave oven. Okay, higher frequencies, higher data rates, and that's the same thing that's going on with uh, the, the uh, version 5 or whatever it's called, cellular stuff right now. Higher frequencies, so higher data rates, but shorter distances, and also less ability to work through walls and inside buildings. Wireless security, well, it's a radio. Anybody can listen to it. Bluetooth has that same problem. In order to keep your wireless transmission secure, they must be encrypted. The early encryption algorithms had bad errors on them, in them. This is what happens when you have electrical engineers instead of cryptologists invite, inventing encryption algorithms. Okay, electrical engineers are pretty smart, but they're not cryptologists, just as cryptologists are not electrical engineers. The so-called wired equi uh, wireless equivalent, wired equivalent privacy, WEP, um, and WPA are obsolete, should never be used, should never have been invented in the first place. If you can use WPA3, you should use that. Otherwise, use WPA2. Don't use any of the earlier ones because they're not safe. Have a nice weekend, a nice spring break, and I'll see you a week from Tuesday. It's over. Go.